in the process of preparing for the Amim Noraim. At the heart of this preparation period is tshuva, one of the most important and unique concepts that the Jewish people have shared with the world. It's a, that is the ability to return to those around us, to God, both as individuals and as a people, and work to gain forgiveness. It is, as our speaker, Dr. Erica Brown, teaches, Teshuva is a form of recovery. As she wrote in her book, Return, Daily Inspiration for the Days of Awe, and here I'm quoting her, we may have said the words of repentance, but not bought in fully to all of its emotional demands. We may have regretted, but not recovered, apologized, but not actualized a new and improved relationship. There's nothing easy about the month of Elul if we really take it seriously. And I would suggest there's also nothing more rewarding. It's during this time that we speak of Michila, the act of going to those we have meaningful relationships with and naming the things that we're sorry for and hoping for forgiveness. I think we all know that what makes this even more challenging is that we're living at a time when the apology has become less of a value. The act of saying, I'm sorry, has become a thing of the past. And with the perpetual memory of Google, forgiveness may also become a thing of the past. Tonight, it will be our honor to study with one of the foremost educators in the American Jewish community. Dr. Erica Brown is the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership and is an associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy at the George Washington University. Erica was a Jerusalem fellow, was a faculty member of the Wexner Foundation, Navi Chai fellow and the recipient of the 2009 Covenant Award for her work in education. She's the author of 12 books on leadership the Hebrew Bible, and spirituality. Her newest book is the Book of Esther, Power, Fate, and Fragility in Exile. She's been published in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Tablet, First Things, and the Jewish Review of Books, and wrote a monthly column for, New York, Jew, for the New York Jewish Week. She's blogged for Psychology Today, Newsweek, and the Washington Post on Faith in JTA, and tweeted on one page of Talmud study a day, it's my great honor and privilege to present Dr. Erica Brown. And I, before you begin, I want to share our condolences and the condolences of our community. Just a few days ago, uh, Dr. Brown's father-in-law, Harvey Brown, Dr. Harvey Brown, passed away in Eretz Israel. He was not only a dentist of note, but he was also a Yodea Sefer, a true student of Torah, and also a Mohel. And uh, he will be missed. And uh, as we say, Zecher Sadiq Livracha. Dr. Erica Brown, we welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rabbi. It's so touching. Uh, first of all, please call me Erica. Dr. Brown is a soda. So, unless you're my undergraduate <laughs> student, we're just going to be friends here. I hope that's okay. Um, you know, uh, I, I spoke with the, I want to thank uh, Amy Karp, who's done a wonderful job organizing this, and thank Rabbi Siegel. I spoke to him a few days ago with them, um, so compassionate and thoughtful. Uh, my, uh, my husband just came back from saying goodbye to his father, who, uh, who fought and, and, and was defeated by Alzheimer's for seven years, long, long years, and uh, he, he had done in his lifetime over 3,000 uh, mila, milot, uh, he brought 3,000 young boys into the covenant. And so I, I hope, uh, with your permission, I'd like to dedicate our learning tonight to the aliyah of his neshama, that his soul should, should rise to heaven and uh, all his good deeds should carry him. So what I, I want to I, I wanna think about with you, I was just joking a little bit to the rabbi before you all got on, that uh, we might need the whole al Khait section for COVID-related offenses. Um, you know, for unmuting and muting people, um, for coming late or registering for a Zoom call and not showing up, uh, for, uh, for mask shaming. I mean, there's, there's just so many things, but I don't know about you, I'm going into this LO season very differently than I've ever, ever gone into it. On the one hand, I think we're all feeling much more vulnerable. 
Um, we're feeling much more isolated. We feel a great need for community that we won't have, perhaps there's some anxiety of the experiences that we won't be able to have in the coming, uh, in the coming weeks and months with our families. Um, and then there's part of me that says forgiveness, the world should be asking forgiveness from us right now. I mean, you know, what is, what is my wrongdoing compared to the wrongdoings of, of the world at large? And whether we're talking about COVID, whether we're talking about the political cynicism and the disrespect and the banter and, and the aggression, where we're talking about racial injustice. I mean, there's so much right now that we're carrying without our normal outlets to put them down. So I want to invite you this Elo to, to really, and I'm, I'm very grateful to, at the beginning of this season of forgiveness, to be able to have this with you and center and ground myself. So in order to do that, I wanna take us back to a story. It's the first story, I'll argue the first penitent of the Tanakh of the Hebrew Bible. Um, but I wanna look at a painting because I think a painting tells us so much about the way that a text has been perceived. So I'm gonna do a little shared screen. We're gonna to go to my art gallery right now. I hope you enjoy the, the visual that I'll share with you. Um, as we talk a little bit about the first penitent, uh, the first sin and the first penitence, and then think a little bit about some of the challenges that we face in this season and how we might do that a little bit better than usual. So what you see here is a very graphic image. It's very, very unlike the treatments of Cain and Abel in typical compositions. So this artist, William Adolphe Bougreau, wrote, it's called The First Morning, and certainly is a little plan words there, the first morning versus the first morning, the morning after Cain killed Abel. Now, if you're a Caravaggio lover or a Titian lover, you know that the Cain and Abel scene was a great chance for an artist to show off his treatment of the musculature of the human being, right? Of, of young men in, in a violent pose against each other. And, um, and all you see is Cain's violence against Abel. You don't really see any suggestion of forgiveness, any suggestion of facing the consequences of what he's done. So I'd love if anyone wants to unmute or drop in the chat room. I know you're very chatty, you're telling jokes to each other. So I wanna be in that circle with you. Um, share with me observations that you have about the way the artist painted this and what you think the artist was trying to communicate about forgiveness here. Um, so I'm gonna allow you to, if you wanna unmute, if you wanna drop a chat uh, note in the chat room, just let me know. I do have your names here, so I can actually call on you if I wanted to be a really teacher-like. Anyone wanna share some observations, some thoughts? I'm gonna go hey, back. I'll go for it. Can you hear me? I can, sure. Okay, um, maybe I'm slightly cheating because I actually went to school for art. I want to experience it's a little, it. Actually, it's painting. a little hard to hear you. It's a little hard to hear you. Okay, hang on one second. Um, outside, is that a little bit better? Oh yeah, much yes. better. Thank you. Oh, now I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, let's. Um, All right, so we move on. Do you, you can drop it in the chat. Okay. Um. Well, I see, less than I see forgiveness, I see more like mourning, I see grief, you know, I see the, um, he's, he's feeling in his soul what he's actually done. And there's a little bit of forgiveness in that the father has his arm around him and his hand on his heart. So they're both mourning uh, the loss. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I fully see the forgiveness, but I certainly see the possibility of it. And in the splayed body, of course, you see the openness of our human vul vulnerability on display. So yeah, thank I'll stop you. There. Uh, <laughs> thank this you. is Trudy. Yes, Trudy, may. go ahead. Thank you. Please. All right, so it's interesting. I did not see that as, uh, I saw that as Cain and Abel, but where is their father, Adam? I see their mother is mm. crying over the death of her son, and her older son is like 
oh my God, I, I don't know why I did it, but I'm so sorry, mom. But where's Adam? And also, this yes. looks a lot like Go some ahead. of the um, um, scenes of Jesus, you know, yes. and, and Mary kind of a thing. So I just throw that in as well. Thank you, Trudy. Um, so I'm just going to ask all of you to go back on mute just so that uh, everyone can um, hear more clearly. Thank you for those beautiful observations that you both made. Um, and you're right, Adam is not here. Uh, if you look at the beginning of chapter four of Genesis, it says that uh, Chava, that, that Adam knew his wife and that, um, and that she had Cain, right? And she named Cain. So um, there was, there's a sense perhaps of the mother's, uh, you know, the, the distinctly uh, motherly, maternal grieving that, uh, that, that evokes compassion from the onlooker. And here you see she is crying into her firstborn, into Cain's uh, chest, and uh, he looks a little bit more primitive, right? And you're right that um, that Abel looks uh, rather Jesus-like here, much more light-skinned, um, and almost uh, scenes where uh, the Virgin Mary is holding Jesus. But here you have a sort of inversion of that. You have Cain, who's killed his brother. Now his brother, technically speaking in the text, is in the ground, and God says, where is your brother? And Cain finally actually has to identify that he's in the ground he doesn't really understand perhaps the consequences fully of his actions. And yet here, when he lies across his knees, it's almost as if you say the wrongdoings that we do that are right in front of us and that grip us by the heart. And that all of a sudden, when we realize what they've done to other people, our heads are bowed and we feel deep remorse and shame. And I think that's what you're, you're seeing in this beautiful picture, a lot of dark, a lot of light that's placed on the dead and also on the mother. So I say that because I want to think a little bit about the change that happens to Cain in this chapter. I'm not going to go through, uh, you all know the story. The story is, is, is very well known. Uh, but of course, there's that moment, um, and I have the Hebrew text in front of me, where Cain gets very angry because his gift is rejected. And then it says that Cain was, you know, comes very distressed and God, God did not heed Cain or his sacrifice. And then it says, Cain, Cain was very angry. His face totally fell. And then God says to Cain, right, when we have that moment where we're about to do something wrong and some, some switch uh, clicks and we refrain, um, that switch now is going to be the voice of conscience, God's voice saying, Lama haralach. Why are you so upset? Why have your, has your, now panim is plural. Um, and it's such a, I think an elegance in Hebrew because the face is always changing. So it's almost like, why are all of your faces fallen, right? It was, there's no sort of retreat from the devastation that you're feeling at this moment. Hello, if you do good, good things will happen to you. You'll be lifted. And it gives him this little lesson in philosophy. And I think it's probably a lesson uh, that Maimonides covers again and again and again in his Laws of Repentance, written in the 12th century. This, I, this notion that you have control over what you do. But Cain, there's a dimension that's added for Cain. And God says, listen, I got to tell you something about wrongdoing. It is sitting on the threshold of your door. Is it's not ever really far from you, but you have the power to shut that door. It's a, actually, it's a powerful image for people struggling with addiction, um, struggling with habits that they're trying to break, not denying that it exists, but saying it is right here. It is always here. So the question is, what are you, what are you going to do about that bad temper, about the hurtful speech that you use, about that particular habit that's jarring? So you know, you have a choice here, but Tatim Shalbo, it's there and it's always going to be kind of crouching and ready to get you, but you can control it. And Cain, it's as if Cain doesn't hear it. And Cain speaks to his brother and in a field and he kills him. So the scene that we have um, that I brought the text for you to look at is, um, is right after this happens. Uh, God punishes Cain 
And uh, he says he's going to be a wanderer. And you know, Cain is a farmer. If you're a farmer, a wanderer is is a heavy. It's a heavy price to be a wanderer. It means that you can't you can't till the soil. You can't watch things grow. Cain says, "Lord, my sin is too great to bear." Gadol avoni miniso. Since you've banished me from the soil, I must avoid your presence and become a restless wanderer. And anyone who meets me will kill me. And God says, "No, I'm gonna I'm gonna protect you." And then he goes to settle in the land of Nod. <laughs> You know, this is a story that's well known, but this one line, my sin is too great to bear, has had an interesting translation history. Many people translate this as my punishment is too great to bear. Someone tells you you've done something wrong, you've wronged me in some way. You say, you know what? You're punishing me. You've withdrawn your affection. You're being too harsh. You're, you're punishing me and it's too much for me. And that's different when you say, Gadol so my sin is too great to bear. I can't live with myself. And I imagine I'm going to invite you all to think of something that's hard for you to live with, something that you've done. You're not going to share it. There's no chat room here, but something where you say, it's really, really hard for me to live with this. And as a result of how hard it is for you, the world has softened to you. So, you know, when, uh, when my kids were little, they're not little anymore, but when my kids were little, if they noticed and felt shamed by what they did, I always mitigated their punishment because I understood that they learned the art of feeling deeply what they have done wrong. And it is an art. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm currently working on a, a book on forgiveness uh, with Deborah Lipstadt, the Holocaust historian and, and close friend. And one of the things that's very striking and the rabbi alluded to it today is that people so they, they ask for forgiveness. Um, if they ask for it at all, it's often in a public setting um, and it's often to redeem their own careers. Uh, we have about, uh, uh, I, I actually, uh, I wrote a book on scandal many years ago and someone sent me a book, uh, the author sent me a book called uh, My Bad, An Apology Anthology. And it was basically 250 pages of public apologies. And the apology was almost always the same. And it was trite. It very often, you know, if you analyze it as a Talmudic text, as I have done with many apologies, you find that it, it simply doesn't work at all. It, you know, it's, it's basically, I'm sorry if you felt that. Um, sorry if you were oversensitive. Um, I didn't mean what I said when, how could you not mean what you said? Um, things like that, which really make us feel this, there's some sincerity and authenticity mi missing in that apology. But you don't find that in Cain you find that Cain is deeply, almost dispossessed by his crime. Anyone want to share any other observations, thoughts at this point? Perhaps observations about the climate and can forgiveness live yeah. in this kind of climate? I'd like to give you a, pass a thought on to you, and that is what you're saying that if you if someone comes to you, you're supposed to accept someone's apology and then forgive them. What if the, what if, if you have been hurt so badly mm. that you really feel that you can't forgive this person? Is that, what happens there? Yeah. We're, we're gonna when talk we're about talking it. about Teshuva, we're supposed to forgive. But again, what, what if you just simply can't do it. Yeah, I, and I think that's really what we're here to talk about. The big sorry is really what happens when you do something that is unforgivable. That's why I actually think the interesting thing is that you've got this sin of Cain right up in the beginning of the Hebrew Bible, basically forcing us to confront this issue. It's hard. I mean, Cain can say, "I God, I, my sin is too great to bear. And God might mitigate it a little bit, his punishment, but God still punished him. It was, there's no question that he was going to be a wanderer. Um, he did eventually found a city, a wife named, had a child named the city after his child. So he did build something. There was a chapter two after his, uh, which we often don't talk about, um, that, that appears in chapter four of Genesis. But, but uh, uh, Neil, I think your name is Neil, right? Uh, that there's, there is a, a certain... A construct here that seems almost asking way too much of us. So let's go back to our text and, and let's keep Neil's question in mind as we as we travel through this text. In particular, this is a, a text from Genesis Rabbah, the Midrashim, ancient 
rabbinic observations on the biblical text. And um, I, I was very, very struck by this. Rabbi Hanina ben Isaac said he went forth rejoicing. As you read, he goes forth to meet you. When he sees you, he'll be glad in his heart. This is actually a text as, as the Midrash was very playful and often put texts together from many different biblical books. Um, this is a text from Exodus about Aaron meeting Moses. And, uh, but it's really an, uh, an observation about Adam meeting Cain. And this is not a meeting that takes place in the Bible. Adam met Cain and he asked, what was done in punishment of you? Now, you're a dad, your kid has just killed your other kid. And the first thing you say is, oh, just like, how many years are you serving? And you know, uh, how many, uh, what's your prison time? And Cain says, I vowed repentance and I was granted clemency. And there was Cain basically says, well, dad, if you're gonna ask me what happened to me, I actually repented and, and God forgave me in part. Upon hearing this, Adam in self-reproach began to beat his face. And he said, such is the power of repentance. And I knew it not. And then he said, it is a good thing to confess to the Lord, um, which is a little play on words of the, the, uh, the uh, verse from Psalms, Tov lahodot. Uh, Lashem, tov hitvadot Lashem. It's good to confess to the Lord. So what you have here is someone saying, I had no idea that forgiveness was possible. I had no idea that forgiveness was possible. Adam wronged. Adam wronged his wife. Adam wronged God. But Adam never had the conversation with God where he said, you know what, God, I, I, I'm struggling with myself and I need to share my struggle. Um, as, as many of us, uh, as you know, as, and not all of us do. So I, I want to share with you that I had a student um, many years ago, and I only teach adults, and I had a student many years ago who converted. And she said, um, I'll tell you one thing, I, um, I'm not a forgiving person. And so uh, if you do something wrong to me, I'm never going to forgive you. And I said, it's really hard to hear that because you converted to Judaism. And Judaism gave repentance to the world. People can't live without forgiveness. They need forgiveness. They need compassion. They need pity. They need a chance to start over. That doesn't mean they don't pay the price for the things that they do wrong. That doesn't mean that the relationship doesn't suffer. But imagine any of us living in a world where there's no forgiveness. And this was almost like Cain's contribution in this midrash. Adam says, I had no idea that forgiveness was possible. And there are many people today who in their heart of hearts don't believe that people really change. They'll say, yeah, it's okay, but I don't believe you, you really, uh, I don't believe you really changed. Just want to read Alice's observation, which means if you're Catholic, believe your confession works, confessions because you have told God what you've done, been given a sentence by the confessional priest. Yes, and in fact, I have to say one of the things that we're, we're studying is the difference between Christianity and Judaism when it comes to forgiveness. People think all religions are the same. Not so true. Uh, when it comes to forgiveness, particularly in things like the Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, Committee in South Africa, where there was a famous case, Saul Schimmel talks about it in his book on forgiveness, uh, Wounds Not Healed by Time, and uh, where, a, where a policeman confesses uh, to the court, uh, to the committee rather, that he, has, uh, that, he, that he killed someone. He killed a black man. I think he set the person's house on fire. And a priest embraces him and says he's been forgiven. And a rabbi stands up and says, what do you mean you have to go to jail, right? It was, this, this isn't a scot-free, this is, this is justice. There's consequences of the things that we do. We can't just get away with them. But in, in our particular Midrash, there's some little sense of, of uh, the, the, almost the invention, uh, the invention, the patenting of forgiveness. It, it's not always obvious to people. And in fact, I think that's one of the, the greatnesses of the season that we enter is that every year we get to, we get to this cathartic period of time where we get to talk through the things that we've done wrong and, and clarify relationships with self, others, and God. And of course, many of you know um, Simon Wiesenthal's famous work, The Sunflower, where he took this head on, this question that Neil asked, I mean, there are things that you can't forgive. So when a, a Nazi comes to a, a when is, is being uh, treated in a hospital, he's on his deathbed, and he asks forgiveness from a Holocaust victim who's working there, the, 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 the victim just walks out of the room and says nothing. And of course, then Wiesenthal creates his, his landscape here in which to think about the theological issues. Should I have forgiven him? Today, the world demands that we forgive and forget heinous crimes committed against us. It urges that we draw a line and close the account as if nothing had happened. 
for, forgetting is something that time alone can take care of, but forgiveness is an act of volition and only the sufferer is qualified to make the decision. And then Wiesenthal opened it up to many writers and theologians to answer, to answer the question, ought this man to have forgiven? And that, that, that book, I remember reading it first in high school as an assignment and has really framed a lot of my, a lot of my thinking on it. The other person I want to share with you, uh, who's, uh, who's a, a philosopher, um, a communitarian, Abishai Margalit, wrote a book, The Ethics of Memory. It's a small, very potent book. And he talks about the impossibility of forgetting. So if you're Jewish, what do you forget? Every, every offense known to you, is, uh, you know, comes back again and again. Um, and, and he says, if forgiveness occurs through forgetfulness, it's not real forgiveness. I mean, it might give you the blessing of clearing the tableau, um, but it's not real forgiveness because forgiveness is a conscious decision to change your attitude and overcome an anger and vengefulness. For, forgetfulness may in the last analysis be the most effective method of overcoming anger and vengefulness. But since it's an omission rather than a decision, it's not really forgiveness. The philosopher says not forgiveness. It's effective, but it's not really volitional. You didn't decide to do it. And, um, and, he, and he tells you why. He says the decision, if, you, if you're with me we're right here, the decision makes one stop brooding on the past wrong, stop telling it to other people with the end result of forgetting or forgetting that once mattered to you greatly. Such a case of forgetting should matter a great deal, both morally and ethically. Um, so actually what I'd like to do now, um, if you don't mind, is I'd actually uh, love to put you in breakout rooms just for five minutes to talk to one other person about, what, about forgetfulness and the relationship to forgiveness. Are there things, you don't have to say what they are, but are there things which you cannot forget and therefore you cannot forgive? So I'm gonna turn it over to Liz and invite you to engage in these conversations. Um, I know they're hard, but they're important. Liz, how are we doing? I'm about to hit uh, create rooms. So okay. Everybody I'll see please you in a few minutes. accept the uh, invitation. Hopefully everyone sees an invitation on your screen to accept the, uh, the room. Not everyone is there. Is everyone? Uh, it's a mix. I'm moving some people around, even though there's not a lot of time. There we go. Whatever time there is. And if anyone wants to talk about it with me, if you're not going anywhere, I'm happy to discuss. Hi, I just uh, popped on. I was actually like on my phone, and not using the camera, so I just popped on. I was in a breakout room, but it was like just me, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Liz, can you? It says we need to be assigned. How are we doing, Liz?
or I can just hang out here with you. <laughs> You're on mute, Miss Erica. Thank you. Thank you. So I said, if, you, if you're here in this room and for one reason or another, you're not in a breakout room, um, thoughts on forgiving and forgetting? Easy, hard, impossible? I find it gets more difficult with age. Why? I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I just have more memories and uh, like a more buildup of various things that have hurt me in the past so i don't i don't know that's layers anyone else want to anyone else wanna jump in there i find it harder to get, forgive myself than forget others wait i just want to see who's speaking because i can't see me here i'll turn my video on for you hi hi ben yeah, yeah forgiving yeah. myself um here hi hi how are you doing Good. Yeah, I don't know if there's something about self-forgiveness or... Um... Was that always the case, Ben? I'm sorry? Was that always the case? I mean, is it is it worse as you've aged? Is it better as you've aged? I don't know. I haven't thought about that. That's a good question. So let's think about it now. Uh, it, are you asking, does, the, does it get harder to forgive myself as I get older? Yeah. No, no, I don't think so. I think it just has stayed much the same. Stay much Maybe the same. I've kind of been able to recognize it and frame it in, in a different way. In a way that's not crippling? It can be crippling not to forgive yourself. Um, frame it in a way that is, yes, not crippling, but is not, it, it, it's, it's not moving me. I haven't been able to move beyond it, if that makes sense. So it's like I put the crippling part in a little box, kind of crammed it deep down or put it way in the back of the closet and day to day, no big deal, but still in the back of the closet. Yeah. Well, the problem with the back of the closet is every once in a while you clean out your closet and then you find it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that could be, that could be really hard. Mm -hmm. Sure. Liz, do you want to um, bring everyone back? Is that, is that possible? I think I think you're. Yeah, I just hit it. They'll break out the you know okay. the countdown. Okay. Yeah, it's about a minute. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to comment? Who's on with us about forgiving self, forgiving others, forgetting? It's hard to forget the things that you do yourself. Right? The way you wrong yourself. I find I remember things that I did, not a lot of things, but things that I might have regretted in the, my treatment of someone in my university years, and I still carry it. I have not oh, fully sure. put it down. Oh, sure. Years ago, yeah. Yeah, I have not fully put it down. Um, anyone else want to comment? I see we have Gary over there. Hello, Gary. Hi, Sydney. You're, you're muted, Sydney. Okay. I uh, was discussing the idea that um, you, can't, you can be forgiven for your transgression, but neither party is going to forget. So you can't go back to the way it was, but you can move forward. But the memory is always going to be there. That, that's not going to be erased. Yeah. The question is how, how much you have to ride over that memory. You know, like, is it, is it smooth or it just, it creates turbulence each time, um, which is hard, you know, it's, it's. Yes, I, I find it creates turbulence each time for me. Mm. Yeah. Get, oh. Whether I'm the one who's forgiving or the other person's the one who's forgiving. That's honest. Um, Liz, are we all back, do you think? We are close to all being back. We've hit almost the same number, so. Right. All right, so pretty close. Um, I hope your conversations were enlightening. I was, uh, I was enjoying the conversation I was having. I don't want to share a little Buddhist story that really helped me a lot. Um, instead of saying forgiving and forgetting, which seem to be very binary, I think about 
carrying the weight of, of disappointment and sin versus putting it down. Um, I know that a lot of people talk about things like baggage and, and that becomes a part of the pop psychology, but um, there's a story that's, that really um, has had a deep effect on me. It was, it's a story of two Buddhist monks who had taken vows of celibacy and they were walking along a path and they find a young woman in distress on the side of the road. She's a beautiful young woman and she cannot walk. And one of the monks picks her up and carries her. Um, the monks return to, uh, to the place that they were going. And one monk, uh, the one who did not carry the woman, was a little disturbed, disappointed, distressed. He turns to the monk next to him um, and he's obviously upset. And uh, the monk who was carrying the woman said, what's the matter? And he said, you know, you took a vow of celibacy and then you carried that beautiful young woman, young woman such a distance. And he said, ah, but I put her down a long time ago. You are still carrying her. <laughs> and I think that's such a beautiful story going into Elul of what we hold on that we have not been able to put down and why we can't put it down and how it may cripple us or paralyze parts of us because of our incapacity to put something down. I want to go back to my source sheet with you. And um, hold on. So I have patience. I don't know why this is okay. Here we go. So, um, and, and this gets to the, you know, really the point that Neil made about that from Maimani's mission to the laws of repentance, I cited earlier, it is forbidden for a person to be cruel and refuse to be pacified. Rather, one should be easy to pacify and difficult to anger. Halavai, as they say that we should all be uh, easy to pacify. And at that time that someone who's done wrong asks for forgiveness, you should forgive him with a complete heart and a willing soul. So think about that expression a lot. When you, when you say, I forgive you, is it with a complete heart and a willing soul? Um, notice those two pieces are different, right? There's a compassionate part of you that maybe on the moment wants to forgive the person who asks for forgiveness, but the willing soul, that's, that's something I think that develops more over time. When you, you, there's a willingness, as Sydney just pointed out, to preserve the relationship. You can't blot something out. That's just, that's just unrealistic. And in fact, I wonder if forgive and, for, forgive and forget would, would have been a combination had there not been alliteration there with the letter F. I think that, that people would have realized it's just not a realistic pairing of verbs. Even if someone's pained and profoundly sinned against and must not be vengeful, this is the way a seed of Israel's hearts are well-intentioned. So when that woman who converted said, the only thing that's really hard for me is I can never forgive anyone, you know, my question was, I mean, that was that's so central and foundational to Judaism to be to be compassionate. Now, of course, um, as many of you know, you you have to you you have to ask someone for forgiveness up to three times. And if the person can't, that person is still carrying it, then, then, then the problem, the sin is no longer yours to bear. It's the other person's for their inability to be pacified. But I understand why you have to ask someone three times, because the fact that I might be ready to ask sorry of you doesn't mean that you're ready to grant me forgiveness. That's really hard. And it's, it's, and maybe not fair for me to emotionally switch a, a, a like, sw it's like switching a light switch. And, and that, and, and that's not what my feeling is. And those, those three times that you ask for forgiveness, they might not occur on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. They might be in September, October, and two years from now, because someone may not be ready. And I think that, that giving the person the readiness, the time to be ready, and the space emotionally to grow into forgiveness is also critical. So I want to share with you that there is a blessing. Uh, I don't know if you say this. Uh, I will tell you that I started saying this some years ago. I always knew about it, but I didn't always say it. And this is a traditional prayer recited nightly before bed. Um, it actually... Um, uh, we uh, there's, there's actually a um, commentator who died in the 1920s, um, the Chavitz Chaim, uh, Rabbi Israel Meir Kagan. And um, he says that if you say this every day, you'll have a long life. Now, I don't know if it's true that you'll have a long life as much as you can shorten your life if you take all these wounds and insults to bed with you and you nurse them throughout the night, you've got your Costco sized bottle of Tums and it's not working. <laughs> because all you're thinking about are all the people who've wronged you. 
So master of the universe, I forgive anyone who angered or troubled me or wronged me, my person, my fan, finances, my dignity, or any other offense. And think about the detail of that. Someone might have offended you as a person, maybe someone borrowed money or, or they tried to cheat you out of money, um, or they, I don't know, undersold something of dignity and value for you, or your dignity, or any other offense. And you know what? We collect so many of these in a lifetime, maybe even in a day, whether it was done under coercion or an act of will, accidentally, intentionally, words, actions, this life or another, to any individual and ask that no one be punished on my account. May it be your will that I sin no more and a return to those ways and I don't have anger um, and the wrongs that I've done been erased by infinite compassion, but not through suffering or sickness. May the words of my heart find favor before you, my rock and redeemer. So, you know, who receives forgiveness in this prayer? Well, actually pretty much everybody. And of course, going to sleep and just saying, I'm actually going to sleep in a state of forgiveness. I'm in some way erasing all those little petty insults that keep people awake, that really shorten the quality of life. And I think it has to be said daily because I think every day we find ourselves in this in this human tussle uh, that, that sometimes results in our feeling these bruises and wounds. Um, and um, I wanna actually uh, think about what happens when we can't forgive people. But I did tell you that I was gonna say when I started saying this prayer. So I started saying this prayer a few years ago when I was the co-chair of the rabbinic search in my shul. And, um, and I am a shul goer, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a davener, um, I love community, but I'm just gonna be honest with all of you, don't tell anyone, not everyone was well behaved in my synagogue around this time. <laughs> and um, and it, was really, it was really actually hurting me. It was hurting me because I started, I started feeling feelings for my own community that I was not happy about. And it, and it certainly was by no means, most people, the majority, it was, often it's just a few people who are particularly difficult um, who may question your uh, credentials or your motivations and intentions. Um, but over, over several months, it began to really get under my skin. And um, I remember after we, we have a wonderful, wonderful rabbi, and everybody has clearly forgotten the the any any malfeasance uh, that they earlier earlier bad behavior. Um, but I remember speaking to a rabbi who was a particular mentor of mine and sharing this feeling with him that I I felt very disappointed in certain people. I feel really uncomfortable in their presence. And he said, Erica, I want you to offer this prayer. I want you to say Hakadosh Baruch Hu, God in your wisdom, help me love your children again. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was very, very effective actually. Um, but I did start saying this prayer at that time and I continued to do so. And it's really made me very cognizant of um, the little ways that we interact with people that irritate us and make us feel, well, why did you say that to me? How come they didn't think of me for that? You know, why did he say that? And that hurt me. And as our families expand and there are more people in our family and more opportunities to hurt people, I think this, this prayer, at least for me, has been, um, has been very comforting. Uh, I don't know if anyone else here says this and wants to you know, share their own experience, but I'm certainly happy to have it. I, I, I wanna share with you, I think, the two sources that I wanna share with you now that I think um, for me have been an absolute game changer as I enter this season. The first is by Hannah Arendt. Um, Hannah Arendt was a social philosopher. As many of you know, she covered the Eichmann trials for The New Yorker. There was some controversy there, but I, I want to read something to you that I go back to again and again. Without being forgiven, released from the consequences of what we've done, our capacity to act, what is it were, be confirmed to a single deed from which we could never recover we would remain the victims of its consequences forever, not unlike the sorcerer's apprentice who lacked the magic formula to break the spell. You know, when someone does something really bad to you, but it was 1964, that person is almost like in an ether. It's like sleeping beauty. They're, they've never moved on. You've never moved on. They've never moved on. Maybe you don't have any of those feelings anymore. Maybe you can't even remember exactly what brought you into that state of, 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 of unsettling um, disturbance, uh, of, 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 of insult, of hurt. You don't even remember what it was. But is it fair to reduce anyone to, their, to a single deed? As Robert Jonathan Sachs says, we sin 
we are not sin, right? We are not the sum total of the worst things that we ever do. We don't want someone else to treat us that way. That there's one thing that someone did and you say, that one thing weighs as much as every good thing. Being able to put things in a larger context of goodness and really telling ourselves, I need to remember the goodness because I want someone else to do that for me. I can't live in a world where people treat treat each other as the single deed from which they can't recover. How does that recovery take place? So this brings us to, and I'll, I'll show you his name, is um, Johann Christian Arnold wrote a small, very powerful book called Why Forgive? He's a Mennonite. Um, and um, I wanted to share this in, in with Hannah Arendt to share this observation and then just open for questions and comments and thoughts and your forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is a door to peace and happiness. It's a small, narrow door and it cannot be entered without stooping. It is also hard to find, but no matter how long the search, it can be found. When we forgive someone for a mistake or a deliberate hurt, we recognize it as such, but instead of lashing out or biting back, we attempt to see beyond it so as to restore a relationship with the person responsible for it. Our forgiveness may not take away our pain. It may not even be acknowledged or accepted, yet the act of offering it will guard us from being sucked into the downward spiral of resentment. It will also guard us against the temptation of taking out our anger or hurt on someone else. Forgiveness doesn't mean ignoring what's been done or putting a false label on an evil act. It means rather that the evil act no longer remains as a barrier to the relationship. It's a catalyst creating the atmosphere necessary for a fresh start and a new beginning. So um, I hope you don't mind, Ben, if I out you that in our conversation, you talked about, you know, the difficulty of forgiving the self and kind of sometimes putting all those problems in a box and putting it in your closet. Well, think about it this way. Um, Arnold has given us a different metaphor. Um, and the metaphor here is the small door. And you have to stoop because it requires some degree of humility to say, you know, I miss that person. I miss that relationship. These were the aspects that I miss about it. No one is asking you to forget. It's as if you're saying, here is the, the wrongdoing. Here's the act. And I've just decided to take a road around it. That wall, that's always going to be there. Maybe over time, it'll shrink a little as some of the hard feelings sort of dissipate, the emotions dissipate, and I can think about it differently. Maybe I can understand it differently, but it'll always be there. And my job isn't to pretend that, I'm, that it's not there. Um, and I, I appreciate Lisa's comment about the cancel culture, um, because um, right now, this notion that we, we just if you said one thing, your political career is over, your, your, whatever it is, your job is over, your friendship is over, your place in society is over. I mean, that's just, that's just hard. And so it's ironic that at the, can the same time as the cancel culture, you have this sort of public forgiveness, which allows a person to, with minimal consequence and minimal change, resume his or her activities if nothing happened, um, where, where some people, their careers are forever ruined. And I don't know, I just, I, I kind of want to think, think of what it means to take this idea that Cain, if you will, in the Midrash discovered or invented or was the first recipient of this notion of this brilliant forgiveness that Adam had no idea about. I can confess, I can talk some, something through and then God will forgive me. I mean, Wow, remember that commercial? Whoops, I could have had a V8, right? And it was, I had no idea. I could be a candidate for forgiveness if I simply came out and said, I can't live with myself. I can't live with what I'm doing. But when you can't live with what someone else has done, do you choose to make that a wall that separates you? So I was once, um, I was once teaching that source about Hannah Arendt um, to a class many years ago, a Melton class, a very beloved class. And many, many months later, maybe it was even a year or two later after the class had met, um, I met a woman in a restaurant. I met the, a woman who, from the class and she came up to me and she, she mentioned the source by Hannah Arendt. And she said, do you remember when you taught that class? And I said, oh yeah, I remember it well. And she said, you know, after that class, I thought a lot about my brother. I haven't spoken to my brother in 10 years. She was a woman in her seventies. She said, I'm getting older. And I've carried this with me for a very long time but actually I started really thinking about him and missing him. I didn't think about him with the angry eyes. I thought about him with the loving eyes, the eyes of a sibling. And I decided to call him. And when I called him, the first thing he said is, 
I've been thinking about you too. I really miss you. And it was the beginning. It's tentative steps. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be all, all bad things are going to be wiped away. But what she was basically saying is life is short and it's time to sometimes put down the things that we've been carrying for a long time. And now I think at least during COVID life is so much more vulnerable. We're so much more fragile. Our need for each other is, is so much greater than it's been before. So maybe it's time to put down some things and to allow, not for forgetfulness, but to allow forgiveness as an act of volition. We're not rubbing away the act. Um, we're kind of in, in the arms of Eve as she's crying over her son, Abel, and thinking to herself, God gave Cain a chance to speak his truth. He said, if you do good, the, the desire to do wrong is always going to be there. But if you do good, you'll be uplifted. And instead of talking back to God, Cain turned to Abel and killed him. There's a chance that we have to take what hurts us and to speak that truth. And maybe that truth will bring us to a state of forgiveness. And sometimes that's not about forgiving others. It might be about forgiving God. It might be about forgiving organizations that hurt us. I know you maybe have never thought about the idea of repentance in relation to an organization that maybe has moved on and changed, but our memory of the wrong that it did us so long ago, we still can't let go of. And maybe we can't forgive ourselves and we have to put that down too. So thoughts, comments, observations, I'm anxious to hear from you. Yeah. I Brown? Yeah. Hi, this is Nikolai. I, uh, first of all, thank you for just a wonderful discussion on the forgiveness. But uh, not to be like some of your old parishioners to get under your skin, but uh, uh, that was only half of the issue. You discussed giving forgiveness. Accepting forgiveness is sometimes as difficult or maybe even more difficult. The Russian uh, uh, author Anton Chekhov has a wonderful story from the you know, mid of 19th century, how uh, the death of a government worker who is trying to, who is receiving forgiveness and he, he cannot accept it. And he continues to, to ask for forgiveness and ask until he becomes a total nuisance and becomes a parody of the issue of forgiveness. So what can you tell us about the ability and the, the approach of accepting forgiveness? Well, so um, thank you, Nikolai. And I always love a little check off and a little check off on a Tuesday night. Is it, is it Tuesday? Yes. It is Tuesday. <laughs> I've been sitting in a Shiva house where we've lost all track of time. But um, I, I think the Maimonides quote, Nikolai, really addresses that about being slow to anger and quick to forgive. And it was the people need our forgiveness. I, I wanna share an absolutely stunning book with you. Not quite the literary feat of anything written by Chekhov, uh, but um, Nadia Bowles Weber is a Lutheran pastor. And she wrote a book, she's written several books and one of them is called Accidental Saints. So she is, Rabbi Siegel, listen to this. Her church is called the House for All Saints and Sinners which is like just a fabulous name. So I don't know any shul, which is called the shul <laughs> for all saints and sinners. Um, well, we have Anshi Amadin, so I guess that's sort of <laughs> out there <laughs> yeah, so the truth, the You're telling the truth. Um, <laughs> anyway, so she tells this story, and it's such a beautiful story. She preaches grace all the time, that you need to give people something that they don't always deserve. That's an act of kindness, right? So if I give you forgiveness, that's an act of grace. You might not deserve it in the moment, but that's what I need to give you. And she grew up in a very rough and tumble way. She had lots of addictions. She's, she struggled. She came to religion rather late. And um, she wrote about, when she was becoming kind of a celebrity pastor, she was taking all these speaking engagements and um, she committed to a couple to marry them who had both gone to her church and they met in her church and they had dated for many years and she was going to do the wedding and they booked her a year and a half in advance because she was getting so popular and her schedule was so full. Two weeks later, by accident, she commits to a speaking tour in Australia on the same date, a year and a half ahead. So she's <laughs> 
<laughs> tries to get out of it. Rabbi, I don't know how, how booked you are for the future, but it just uh, keep in mind. So she says, I'll pay in Australia. I'll, I'll uh, like, how can I do this? Uh, could they come to Australia? She couldn't figure it out. And she felt so, so terrible. And um, the Australian said, we've already printed the material. She was willing to forego her fees. Anyway, she gets a text from the, from the woman, from the, from the bride. And the text says, dear Pastor Nadia, um, you have taught us grace and we want to release you from doing this wedding because we feel it's really important for you to, um, to, to preach your truth um, on another continent and people need you and we want to forgive, we want to forgive you and release you from this obligation. She read this text and she just cried profoundly. And she said, this is the sting of grace, right? It hurts to realize that you've done something wrong. Um, but sometimes someone will forgive you even when you don't deserve it. And that forgiveness takes a lot. I bet it was hard for them to say, you know what? We booked you a long time in advance and this was your mistake. We all make them. And it's such a relief when someone can hold that mistake and honor it and just in, in, some, way, in some way give us the space we need to be human and to be small and to be wrong. So I, I love all of this and um, it's so it's beautiful and it's meaningful, but I'm thinking about, I have a question about the other side. Like, isn't there a point at which, you know, if we're talking about forgiveness and preserving relationships, are there not some relationships that aren't worth preserving? Like what if it's not one small act? What if it's something that reveals a pattern Sure. And what if it's like someone in an abusive relationship, if that person's thinking, I need to keep forgiving, they're keeping themselves in a bad situation. And in that case, forgiveness would be actually not helpful. No, I, I mean, we're not obligated to be in relation. This is when you want to stay in a relationship, when there's something to hold on to, when you can put in the context of goodness. But look, there are plenty of toxic people out there. I don't have to tell you. And we need to make space for them and say, your toxicity is your decision, but it, I don't necessarily have to live with that. Now it's much harder in a family situation and I'm not a counselor and, you know, and, and, and I think many situations require professional help. I will just share one observation. Many, many years, my husband's English and many, many years ago when we first married, I lived in England and I ran a school uh, for very, very intelligent high school juniors and seniors um, who were going to prep schools. They weren't going to Jewish schools. And we talked about Maimonides laws of, uh, honoring one's parent. And I could see that she, the student was increasingly agitated in the class. And she, when this, the other students left, she began to bawl. She couldn't, she couldn't, you know, it was the kind of crying when you can't speak, you know, those kind of tears. And I waited and she said she was obviously a child in an, uh, an abusive relationship, I believe with her father. And she said, know about I can't honor my father. How can I honor my father? And I said, you know, it doesn't say that you have to love your father. It says no way that you have to love your father. If your father needs money, if he needs to be moved, if he needs some food when he's old, then, and you, you're in a position where you can do that, then you can do that. But that doesn't mean that you have to love him. Um, and I, that was a tremendous release for her. And I think a lot of times we, we emotionally force ourselves to think, I, ha I have to feel this because I'm in this kind of relationship. Um, I think, I think if you can't forgive, sometimes it eats you up and, and that's a price to pay, right? Someone's living in your brain rent free for a really, really long time. And that's when the Buddhist story, I think about putting some, putting some of that down. But I think we force ourselves into relationships sometimes that I mean, of course, some relationships are worth preserving and working hard at, but not all of them, sadly. Any other thoughts? One more thought before we end, I wanna honor your time. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, bring up an idea with you. Uh, the other day when uh, you and I were speaking, uh, we talked about Sorry Watch, yeah. which is a really interesting website, which basically dissects apologies, kind of doing what you were doing, yeah. almost looking at them as a text. And they pray, according to their words, they praise the good ones and they discuss what makes them good and then they trash the uh, bad ones in some pretty severe ways. Yeah. And they, they put things up to ridicule. So I was thinking about this and thinking about the fact that we, that, that the kind of hard work of relationships, 
that goes into this notion of the chilas we, we've been talking about tonight has largely been lost in the larger Western culture. And I wonder if you could comment about that, but also tie it to Lisa's um, uh, comment that doesn't that also is, doesn't that also lead us to cancel culture? Mm. The fact well, that we can't have these conversations simply says, okay, I don't want, you know, you don't exist anymore. I right. will value the really. So I was wondering what your thoughts yeah, were. Yeah, I mean, or ghosting, which I didn't even know was a term until I, my, my kids taught me, you know, where you just don't respond to anyone anymore, right? So canceling them is, is actually paying attention to them and saying, I can't, you know, I, I can't tolerate this. Ghosting, I just disappear from the relationship altogether. Um, so I, I'm glad you pointed to Sorry Watch. It's a little bit like My Bad and Apology Anthology in the sense of, and the New York Times, by the way, in the business section of the New York Times for a little while, they had the worst apology of the week. Um, and let me just say, there was stiff competition. Um, you know, these were corporate right, CEOs, um, you know, people in positions, of, all kinds of positions of power who who just really weren't taking the people they serve, their constituent population seriously at all. And um, I, I almost feel like I, I retreat from this modern way of speaking about people into these texts and sources of old because they feel much more comfortable and natural to me than the kind of binary way that we, we believe, Jews believe in uh, what we call a machlok et l'shem shemayim, arguments for the sake of heaven. We believe in debate cultures. Every page of the Talmud is about debate. And we're not asking forgiveness to have a thought that's different than your thought. We're asking to respect the thoughts that we have. I don't know how to have that conversation today. I need to tell you that someone pulled me out of shul some years ago before the last election and said, Erica, uh, can I, it was right before Musaf, Erica, can we go over the talking points that I made to go to this person's house for Shabbat lunch because they, they didn't like my political choice last time and I felt so humiliated. I said, and I put my arm around her and I said, you do not need talking points to go to someone's house for Shabbat lunch. If that's where we are, the conversation we have to have is very, very deep indeed. And it was, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like unearthing and like a, a kind of a deep, uh, it's almost like the Korach, the swallowing of the earth. And, and just saying, we, we need to start at ground zero. I actually was, was almost hopeful that COVID would create um, some kind of equalizing field where we could actually have a different kind of conversation. And I don't think that that's proving to be the case at all. Um, but I, I really do turn to us as Jews um, in, in the spirit of Isaiah in chapter one, where he says, learn to do good. I think we need to learn to say sorry. I think we need to learn to accept a sorry. You'll say, what does it mean to learn to do good? I don't think that it's very elementary. I don't, I'm not sure that we're all working with the same fundamental principles of how to treat each other anymore. So I think we need to, and that's, that's you know, why I think it's important for us to continue having these conversations and to model it. If you can say, and by the way, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this for right wing, left wing. Um, I know many liberal progressives and I count myself politically in that camp who um, can't understand why someone would not vote the way that they vote. They, they, can't even, they can't even entertain that someone would think differently. Um, they shame them. I, 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 I just, that's not the kind of culture that I wanna leave for my children, my grandchildren. I, I, I think we can do better. And I, I think we, we only have ourselves to start with. So in terms of saying, can I model this Elul? Can I have a con conversations with people who are not like me? Can I see another person's point of view? Can I break down and be vulnerable and share my struggle and share where I have my cane moment? where I'm not so able to live with myself and I have to beg someone for forgiveness. Um, that's a little bit of a heavy ending. Um, and I, I, I don't want a heavy ending. I want to, I want to ha like have, have apples and honey with you and, and, and wish you the best of, of years ahead and, and certainly good health and um, good health and peace of mind and, um, and beautiful relationships and healed relationships. And I want to thank you. This has been a very healing conversation after a, a very rough few weeks. And I, and, and just feels very sacred and holy for me to be in this space with you. Really Shana Tova. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. I look forward to having you again. And please, if you haven't read Erica's books,
please look at them, um, especially the books on the High Holidays. I'm sure you'll be enriched by the spirit as we have been tonight. Todah Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much.